So the, the power list is something we put together every two years. This is our, our fourth version now. And it's put together within these four walls uh, here at Decanter. But first and foremost, we take soundings from our contributors and various wine figures around the world. We take nominations from them. But then we put together the final list ourselves. And it's, uh, it's a necessarily subjective exercise, and, and purposely so. It's not a scientific list. It's not meant to be merely a repetition of the, the biggest brand owners and chief executives in the world of wine. It's really more about charting the trends in wine and also reflecting where the power lies, where the influence lies, and uh, which are the companies that are really being innovative and uh, taking uh, wine and leading fashion among, among consumers, and that's what, what we see on the shelves. The real reasoning behind it is to try and shine a light for consumers' benefit on um, how wines get on the shelves and why and which wines are there. Quite often there's a, consumers, I think, are slightly in the dark as to, as to who wields the real power and influence in the wine world and why certain wines have huge distribution and other wines don't. Um, and you've got to remember these days, the wine world it is just that. It's an absolutely global industry. Things are moving at a rapid rate. And we've seen this year in particular with the, uh, the increased uh, influence of areas like Asia in particular, how that then has a knock-on effect further down the chain and, and around the world. Well, the rise of, um, of uh, various Asian entrants on the power list was a big trend this year. Um, and that at all levels, really. So, for example, uh, we have uh, Baron Eric de Rothschild at number two, now obviously known for his uh, ownership of Lafitte and the various uh, Rothschild brands, uh, notably in Bordeaux. But the reason he's so high this year is because of the explosion of interest in, in Lafitte, in, in China in particular, uh, and the knock-on effect that then has, not just to the prices of class growth wines in, in China and across the world. Uh, but also, when you've got an, a, a, an emerging market like China, the question then is, OK, they've gone mad over Lafitte and the class growths of Bordeaux. Will that then have a knock-on effect to other premium wines? How will tastes develop in China? Will they be more... Uh, will the market be more uh, influenced by, by brands? or by, by vintages, for example. I think, though, I mean, uh, possibly the, uh, the most instructive element of, of the palace was the fact that we debated long and hard uh, and struggled to really come to a conclusion as to who ought to be at the top of that list at number one. Uh, we eventually uh, decided on Pierre Pringuet of, of Pernod Ricard. Um, but that in itself, I think, shows, how, shows another trend, which is the, the, the increasing democratisation of wine, really. Um, in the fact that there wasn't a dominant figure as there, as there has been in the past. Uh, we're seeing um, some of the big companies, uh, the likes of Constellation being the most uh, obvious, of course, having had a tough time over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, equally, when you think of the biggest wine producers, uh, Gallo would be at the top of the list, but they're, they're, they're dealing only in, in American wines, Californian wines, of course, uh, for, the, for the most part. And, the other wine that they do produce, uh, one of them in, in the Longwood Dock, of course, they had some, some problems with and a bit of embarrassment there, the whole fake Pinot scandal. Um, so, uh, yeah, th we came back to, actually, at one stage, we were looking at and considering uh, the idea of the anonymous consumer blogger, or the wine blogger, per se, who's uh, actually at number 16 on the list. Um, and I think what we're seeing here is, with the increase of social media, with the ease in which consumers and, and bloggers as a whole can now communicate. We're seeing real empowerment of consumers, which is, is a great thing. Um, and that's something we really wanted to, to reflect this year. Uh, in terms of the future, looking ahead to the next two years, I think that, that democratisation of wine that we've spoken about and the increased empowerment of the consumer is something that we'll, we'll see continue. Equally, I'm sure that, um, as we've already mentioned, you know, wines being made in China, not just distributed, but I think the Chinese winemaking scene itself uh, will be really interesting to watch, and I'm sure there'll be some, some movement there.